Good morning, Billy Claudio here, Oasis Community Church. Glad you're taking time to be with us today. Uh, this is our normal communion Sunday. We do it once a month, and so at the very end of service, I want to invite you to participate with us in taking communion. Um, Pastor Tim's going to lead it for us at the end, so uh, I know a lot of people enjoy the process of sharing together, and we love to do it together as well, but obviously in our social separations, we're not going to be able to do that today, but you can still do that together with us as a church uh, at the end of service today, so I encourage you to take advantage of that. You know, last week I, I shared a prayer with you that churches all around the globe are praying, and uh, over 80 different countries are a part of this. I mean, excuse me, 180 different countries and hundreds of millions of people are being a part of this process of praying for our world. And so as a church, we're joining together with these many churches that are praying this specific prayer together, inviting God to do something special on our behalf. So I want to begin today with this prayer. It's called Unite 714 uh, Prayer Gathering. And so we're doing this. And they're also inviting people that at 714 every day, 714 in the morning, 714 in the evening to say a prayer. Prayer for God's grace and goodness to come and fall upon the circumstance. So would you join together with me as I open up today with this united prayer with those around the globe. O Lord our God, look in your mercy upon the suffering that covers the earth. A force called COVID-19 is dominating governments, derailing economies, and destroying peace. It is an ever-present challenge bringing pain and devastation upon your creation. Yet we declare the name of Jesus is above all names in heaven and on earth. We believe, as your Holy Scripture has taught us, every person, problem, pestilence, and power must bow before the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask that COVID-19 be halted and eradicated. Lord Jesus, you created the world and everything in it. You healed the sick, walked on water, fed thousands, and raised the dead. You rule and reign, and you said, if we ask anything in my name, I will do it. So in the name of Jesus, we boldly ask for our families, our churches, our cities, and nations to be protected from the effects of COVID-19. We know the name of Jesus has great power when, you, when we speak it. You are our Savior and our Lord. We know that even now you are at the right hand of the Father interceding for people as they battle COVID-19. Lord Jesus, we are confident in the power of your name. So we ask you to give scientists, researchers, and medical personnel the supernatural strength and wisdom needed in their battle against COVID-19. We ask for healing and restoration in the lives of all those affected by this disease. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus that is above every name, the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone in agreement said, Amen. Well, we're in a series called Out of Control, and I think that if there's ever a time that maybe we've felt like things are out of control, this for many people is one of those experiences, um, and being out of control is never a good feeling. Um, it, we feel all kinds of stress and anxiety and difficulties and challenges hit our soul when things seem out of control, and I, I'm going to share some things with you and some scriptures that I think are going to maybe really influence the way that you perceive your experience right now and hopefully inspire a faith or a new determination within you that, that God is at work and things are going to be okay. Because God wants to stir in your heart today. He wants to do something special for you. He wants to do something special in you. And believe it or not, even in the midst of what's going on, He wants to do something special through your through you. Your life matters. And your life is not just about you. It's about so many others that are part of the story that's being told. And um, our series that we're doing is out of control. And today is an invitation to say, what does it mean when things are out of control? You know, at times when things are out of control, it might mean that someone that's better suited in control can take care of something. And there's an invitation today in this mindset of us being out of control. Maybe it's because we should be relinquishing control to somebody else. I want you to first know this about God. Jesus came to the earth for a reason. He came to die for our sins, but he also came to subject himself to the troubles and pressures that we would feel so he would understand what we're feeling. God Almighty came in the form of flesh so that he could experience what we experience. And I want you to know today, he understands what you're feeling. The writer of Hebrews reminds us that, listen, he came to express and expose himself to what we went through so that when we would offer our prayers to him, that he would have sympathy for us and empathize with our struggles and difficulties. You know, right before Jesus was to be taken away and eventually crucified. Um, this was kind of his last night with the disciples. We, we see in his humanness the struggle that he had in his own pressure when things were, in essence, leaving his control of what his human body wanted. You know, every one of us want to strive to live and not die. Every one of us in our bodies will do anything that we can to protect and pr preserve that which we know of our body. But when Jesus was at the last night before he was taken away, he was praying, knowing that the idea that he was going to be taken, that he was going to be brutalized, that he was going to be killed, and there was a part of his human nature that said, man, I don't want that suffering. 
Some of you are suffering that right now. You, you don't want some of the sufferings. I want, I want you to just hear Jesus' experience with the disciples. It's found in Matthew 26, verse 38 says this. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed and sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. So the disciples had gone. He'd taken them to the Garden of Gethsemane. I, I, I was there this last year, and it's a really a amazing place that Jesus had taken them. He said, keep watch with me. I want you to pray with me. Going a little further, he fell down to his face to the ground and prayed, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. It's an interesting thing that he's saying. He's saying, Lord, I, I know what I want. I don't want this death. I don't want this suffering. I don't, want, I don't want these challenges. And I know many of you today, you're going, man, I don't want some of the things I'm dealing with. The, uh, the lack of funds. You, you look into your future and you go, man, everything's been, been changed. There's some things drastically different today. Maybe relationships are struggling. Maybe challenges with your physical body are difficult. And you might be saying, man, I don't want this. And I want you to know that Jesus relates to that mode. The story continues on. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you do not fall into a temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. What was Jesus really doing in that moment? He was actually saying, listen, if I was in control and in charge, I wouldn't let this, what is about to happen to me, happen to me. But Lord, I relinquish the control of my life to what is going on. And today there's a, an encouragement as we step into the conversation today. We're going to go into a really neat story of seeing Jesus interact with a couple di different individuals. But the idea of relinquishing control, the truth is control that we don't really have. Many of you are feeling that sense of out of control and you wish you could control things. But I want to submit to you, maybe today you in your heart of hearts would relinquish the control that you've been exuding in your life and say, you know what, it's time for me to let go of the control I've had and give it to the only one that truly has the power to control. And so in this invitation, I'm inviting you to let go, to relinquish the control that you've had and invite God to do something special in your life. You know, Jesus was telling the disciples the power of letting go, not living for themselves anymore, but living for a higher cause. In Matthew 10, verse 39, the New Living Translation, he says this, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. Or if you try to control your life, if you try to master your life, you're going to end up losing it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. In other words, if you can relinquish the control of your life, and you give it to me, you're going to really would find, find what life is all about. And that's an invitation I want for you today. Maybe you relate to the idea that life is out of control. And I want you to know that the secret recipe for having new life come to you and having a, a freedom of experience and what you're going through now is really to let go of your life and say, Lord, I want to find you in the midst of this. I want to give you my life. I relinquish control because I want to find what life is all about. We're going to tell a story today that is a story of Jesus engaging in, in Mark chapter 5. He meets a, a synagogue leader and a woman. Two different people from two different backgrounds, two different stories in their life. But there's something that's unique about the, the design of God bringing them together in this one story. And it's a story of 12s. And I'll talk about it that at the very end. There's 12 years for a woman and 12 years for a girl. And, um, but as I tell this story... I, and the conclusion I want you to discover is that God in this story is inviting you to find yourself in the same, same position that these two individuals in the story are being told about. You know, our lives are interconnected. And these two people in the story, you wouldn't think their lives were interconnected at all. They, they come from different sides of the track, different social economic upbringings. But yet there is an, a cross um, piece in their life that brings them together. And uh, we're going to discover that the truth is, is there's, there's connections in our lives and interconnections in our lives that sometimes we are unaware of, but God is inviting us to potentially, in the midst of this social distancing where everybody is separated, to find the avenues of this interconnection, this opportunity to see one another in a unique way. So I want to begin in Mark chapter 5, verse 21 says this, When Jesus had crossed over by the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Obviously, Jesus always drew crowds because of the miraculous power, the divine teachings, the inspiration that he gave to people. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Now, Jairus was a Jewish leader in the synagogue and um, very affluent, very respected in his community. And I'm sure that his engagement with Jesus, there are many people that have told him, listen, don't go to Jesus. You know, he's, 
He's uh, one of those other people. He's not following the guidelines. He's not going by the rules. As a matter of fact, he's kind of pushing back on our Jewish heritage and culture and religion. He's causing a little bit of trouble. And there's probably people that told him, you know, Jerry, S., don't, don't go to him. It'll be bad for you to be bad for your reputation. I, I think that there are many of us that have had people in our lives that we respected, that we honored, that we trusted, that have told us, hey, you know what? Stay away from that Christian stuff. Stay away from that woo-woo kind of stuff. You know, if there's no hope to be had there, there's no help. It's kind of, uh, it's for weak-minded people. And it, it, in that conversation, in that communication, many of us have maybe strayed away or stepped away from hope that possibly could be found in Jesus. But Jairus was in a desperate situation. He was in a difficult situation that all those that had said to him, don't waste your time going here, there's something in him that spoke louder than all of those naysayers to come to Christ. You know, many of you, you're watching today and you've probably had people that have told you, hey, you know, that Christianity stuff is crazy. Listen, you're watching for a reason. You're hearing for a reason because just like Jarius, there's something inside of you that is longing to connect to your very divine purpose and the one that created you. And today, as, as you pay attention, as you listen, I want you to know that God is speaking to you specifically. We find him in this story engaged, but for him, life was out of control. There was a situation and a circumstance that he was coming across that he could not manage. It was bigger than him. And we find in the very, very next verse, he said, you came to Jesus. He pleaded with him earnestly, uh, pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Man, imagine those words. Some of you have known that experience. Some of you have felt that experience. You've, you've been through this bitter sense of, of losing someone that you love. He finds himself coming to Jesus because his daughter was dying. It was a conclusion already. She is on the end. She is moving toward death. Please come and put your hands on her so that she may be healed and live. The cry of his heart was, I need help. I can't control the circumstance. I can't control the situation. If things continue to go the way they're going, I know what the end is. It is death. And in his desperation, it made him leave his comfort zone. It made him leave all the critics and all those that told him to stay away and find himself at the feet of Jesus. His plea was earnest. And he had a glimmer of hope that maybe if Jesus responded, something new, something special would happen. The very next verse, I love this, so Jesus went with him. I want you to know that the heart of God is to come with you, to go with you, to meet you in your challenging you're difficult the things that are out of control he wants to come and today i'm, I'm saying to you he's your your plea your comes to him and he says i'm coming to you i i want to reach out i want to supply he went it goes on to say and a large crowd followed and pressed around him now this is interesting you know jesus is on his way to jerry's house because of the plea the cry and i'm sure jerry's is like man time is of the essence we've got to get you to my house my daughter is dying we need to get this done quickly the crowd is coming around and jerry's i'm sure is trying to make a way for jesus as the crowd is coming get out of the way we have some place to go there's an urgency in his soul there's a there's a critis, criticalness in him saying we've got to get this taken care of now because my daughter's dying verse 25 picks up and this is where the intersection of lives come together and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Remember that, 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. We all know what that feels like, right? Some of you have you've dealt with some challenges and difficulties, addictions, and you said you've strived to get better. You've tried to do things to get better. Now you just find yourself getting worse. The epidemic has only made the, the sinister of you come out in a bigger way. Maybe the bad part of you, maybe is being exposed in more. Maybe the, the things that you struggled with before now are even coming in a different way. And you're thinking, I'm not better. I'm getting worse. And I want you to know that this woman found herself. She spent all of her money. She, she was now impoverished. She did everything she could to fix her problem and couldn't find it. But just like Jarius from a different world, she finds herself coming to the only one that she thought could potentially put things back in order or do something significant. It says in verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, I love this, you know, what you think matters. The thoughts that you have have impact and influence on your daily living. 
Some of you are experiencing dread and sorrow and suffering and because your thoughts are allowing you to go down that path. I want you to know the Bible teaches us inspirational things to think on the things which are true, honest. Just the power of those thoughts can inspire and encourage in the midst of great adversity. You know, when a, when a house is on fire, people that aren't a part of saving, their thought is get out. But a fireman has a different thought. He says, you know what, I have to go in. I've got to redeem. I've got to save. What, what's the difference? It's just the way that, that they have prepared themselves to think. And for so, some of you, I'm inviting you that today is a day to say, maybe I I need to change the way that I am thinking. It says, because she thought, and I'll say this, what you think about when you think about Jesus can make a world of difference in your outcome of experience. I'll say that again. What you think about when you think about Jesus can make a world of difference in your outcome of experience. What did she think about Jesus? She, because she thought, it says this, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. That's what she thought. She'd seen a miracle. She'd heard about his miracles and in her heart. Jarius was saying, hey, if you can come to my house. She was, if I can just touch his garment, right? This difference of thoughts. And again, neither one bad or good. It's just the idea of what was in, possessed in someone to say, this is what I believe. Verse 29 says, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt her, that her body, that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized the power had gone out from her. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? Now, imagine this, right? Jairus is desperate for Jesus to get to his house. Jesus is going through the crowd. Jairus is making the way. Jesus has this encounter with this woman with this faith that reaches out and touches his garment. And Jesus stops on his journey to save this daughter, to redeem the story of Jairus, and turns and says, Who has touched my clothes? I'm sure Jairus was like, why are you, who cares? Come on, man, come on, man. I'm desperate to, we've got to get something fixed. Something has to happen at my house. You need to get to the, where the problem is. Not understanding that in that moment, this intersection of Jairus and this woman was a divine intersection of God's graciousness and goodness. Jesus says, who touched my clothes? The disciples said, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? In other words, there's people everywhere. Jerry, I'm sure Jerry is frustrated to say, it doesn't matter. Let's just keep going. We don't have time to do this. Let's, let's move on. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. Remember, Jerry earlier had fallen at his feet, inviting him to come. Now this woman falls at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. And listen, we, when you know, a woman is telling the truth here, you know, says the whole truth. Another uh, uh, story in the Bible says she, she told him all about her life, which... You know, when a woman's telling all about her life, we know that could be maybe a period of time. So Jairus is sitting, this woman is explaining to Jesus her experience, the doctors she'd been to, the tragedy she'd been through, the trouble she'd been through, the amount of money that she spent. And, and all of this was consuming time. And then Jairus' soul, I'm sure it was a great burden to say, shut up, woman, let's go on. But Jesus, in his compassion and understanding with this woman, allowed her to share her story, her story of faith. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I want you to notice, he said, your faith, what you think about me is making a difference in your experience. It's making a difference not only in your body, but it makes a difference in the way you approach me. The one who had authority and power to do what needed to be done, she put her hope and faith in the one that had the authority and the power to make the change. He made the difference in her life and she believed that he had the authority and the power to do it. You know, some of you today struggle with the idea of the identity of Christ and the authority and power that he has to redeem your situation. And today's an invitation to say the, the essence of your faith, if it is not anchored to something solid, a truth, a principle of who Jesus was, then, then, then the, the strength of your faith is based on just a premise instead of truth and reality. I want you to know that he has the power and authority to do everything that needs to be done within your life. We see in this story this this idea of the opposites connecting. You know, Jesus made her well, but her faith was a part of the story. We see the Jairus, and let me just talk about the opposites of who they were. You know, Jairus obviously was a man. She was a woman. In this culture, it was night and day. If you were a man, you had privilege and, and, and all the good things. If you were a woman, you were a second-class citizen. You didn't have much. We see in the story, Jairus was named. He was prominent. He was someone special. She was unnamed. We didn't even find her name. He was honored and respected. She was shamed and rejected. She couldn't even be, honestly, in public because if she was in public with the issue of blood that she had, she, she could be killed for it. She, he was a ruler of a synagogue, and she couldn't even go to the synagogue, again, because of her physical issue that 
made her unclean to go to any ceremonial experience. He, he was wealthy, she was poor. They have nothing in common on the surface, and yet life had put them in the exact same position, right? They were both in need of something that was out of their control. They both needed to surrender and submit themselves to God. They both came to the same position on their need of request and said, God, I, I need you. I need your work. They were in the same place, in the same posture, because why? They were desperate for an answer. Maybe you find yourself in that place today. You're desperate. Listen, desperation does something in us in our longing, in our faith, in our belief. You know, sometimes I think Christians for the longest period of time, we can live without desperation and there's no transformation and no, no reformation because we're not desperate for God to do something in us. And I want to invite you that as our hearts become more desperate, it opens us up to the activity of our posture before God to say, God, I, I'm letting go and letting you. Both of them had to deal with something that they couldn't handle. Life has a way of putting everybody on a level playing field. Didn't matter status, it didn't matter prestige, it didn't matter money. It mattered that life was difficult and life was beyond managing. And maybe you find yourself today that life is beyond managing, you can't control. And I'm going to invite you, this is the, the idea of relinquishing that control to God and saying in your own desperation, God, I need you. Because when you're desperate, you approach God differently. Desperation can be the beginning of a breakthrough. It can be the beginning of a new tomorrow because our hearts become open to the work that God is doing. You know, this is a beautiful picture of the gospel that we find in this passage. Different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different social economic worlds. And yet here we find this cross section, this interaction of people that have come together to discover the very same truth that God in his goodness and his grace can meet us where we are at. It continues on in verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Man, just those words, the heartbreakingness of those words coming out of those people's mouths that came to tell Jairus that it's too late, time is over. They said, why bother the teacher anymore? You know, I know that when Jairus was, heard those words, his heart sunk deeply in those comments behind, you know, time to let the teacher go. It's too late. It's Time is gone. It's past what you needed. What he could provide is done with. His heart sank there. The naysayer that said, you know what? He's just a teacher. And they, they used that term. You know, see, Jesus was a healer. Jesus was a deliverer. Jesus was a miracle worker. They didn't relate to him in the, that way. They didn't think about it in that way. They just called him, hey, let the teacher, the one that just spouts out things with his mouth, go. And you listen, I want you to know that Jesus is more than a teacher. Yes, we can get instruction and inspiration, but I want you to know that Jesus has the power and authority to influence your world, influence your life, and to touch your life in a meaningful way. Overhearing, he went on to say in verse 36, overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. I love this. That Jesus met him here, this fear grips him. Wow, my daughter's dead is what has been told him. And Jesus looks him in the eye and says, son, don't be afraid, just believe. Jesus looking at him. He just had performed a miracle right before him and looks at him now in the midst of this. Yes, death has been quoted. Death has been said. It seems like brokenness is what you have to come your way. But Jesus says, just believe. He grabbed him. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Jesus takes charge now. The crowd is still doing the same thing. I'm sure in this miraculous mode for the woman, there's some celebration. Verse 37, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter. James and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. <laughs> Listen, unbelief will always laugh at the language of faith. You know, Jesus knew something they didn't know. Jesus, the one who is the resurrection and the life, who has power over death itself, when he said what, and spoke what he said, he knew what was yet to come. And those that laughed at him didn't understand the context of him. They didn't understand the authority or the power that he had or the influence that in that moment he was going to exude. But Jesus had to deal with this lack of faith. These people that actually laughed at the statement of, of, of faith that he was communicating. And it says this, after he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him. You know, sometimes one of the best things you can do is to silence the naysayers around you. Put them out. Get them out of your life and say, you know what? It's time for me to let God's word and God's voice stimulate and stir my heart so that I would believe, so that I'm not walking in fear. In verse 41, he said, he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. 
Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. As this, they were completely, at this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Jesus, concerned about the well-being of the girl, hey, get her some food, right? A mir great miracle. And his first thought is, get, this, get her something to eat. I, I want you to know that we see that, this is where I want you to see in this story. See, this woman had the issue of blood for 12 years. This girl is 12 years old. And you know, those of you that watch This Is Us, that great television series, it talks about life and people's interactions and whatnot in life. You know, you can take this story and, and maybe this is the place where you flashback and the flashback, you'd see a mother and a father coming out of a hospital with a newborn babe and celebrating and smiling. And at the same time, someone walking out of the door right next to them that has just received the word that they they have a blood disorder that, that can't be cured, that it could take her life. And you've got these two individuals coming out of the hospital, one in great celebration, one in great sadness, and, and in their inability to be connected at that moment. And maybe to reach to care for one another or to find celebration in the one and, and comfort for the other. They just went about their lives. They missed maybe an opportunity of experiencing and expressing the life that God offered them together. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans 12, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. You know, sometimes... You know, we need to learn to, you know, rejoice with people that celebrate. I know some of you have been praying for a miracle. You've been hoping for something to get better. And maybe you've been hoping for that new job or things would get better financially. You, and you just, your cousin just called you yesterday and said, I got the job. And, and there's a part of you that's kind of mad that they got the job and you didn't get the job. And you can't rejoice with them because you're saying, what about me? I want you to know that today, if you're finding yourself in that struggle, I join with you in that mourning, that suffering, that difficulty, that challenge. And I want you to know that I'm praying for you. I'm, we're asking God to work on your behalf. We want to be a supply and an encouragement and an enrichment, whatever measure that can be. But I also want to invite you to take a look at the things that God is doing, that opportunity of celebration, that opportunity of giving yourself. Because, you know, the significance of the 12 is, you know, you don't have to be a great student of numerology in the Bible to see that the number 12 has a, has a significant influence we find that God in his covenant with man, when he raised up Abraham, that gave birth to Isaac and began to fulfill his promise through Jacob that had 12 sons, which we know is the 12 tribes of Israel. Why? What did they represent? They represented God's power and authority on the earth. They, they represented God's covenant with man and his interaction with man. And we know in the Old Testament, when the priests would go to the temple, they, they wore these breastplate that they had on. They have the 12 stones that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. What did they represent? They represented the power and authority of God on the earth between God and man. They, they were that representation of the authority of God. We know in the first stories of Jesus' engagement with man, he was... 12 years old, he was at the temple teaching with those that were at the temple, all the leaders of, of spiritual authority. And there Jesus was engaging and con conversing with them. And they were astonished at his knowledge and his wisdom and what he knew at 12 years old. We know when Jesus began his earthly ministry, he, uh, you know, picked 12 disciples, right? Why? As, an, as a representation of his power and authority. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus gave power and authority to those 12 to say, hey, represent me. Go and do what I do. And we even know that Judas was one of the, one of the 12. You might say, well, he should have just done 11. Well, listen, Jesus, even with those that hated and despised, he allowed to be a part of the story of redemption and opportunity. I want you to know there's something significant about this idea of 12. It's really a representation of God's divine authority. The story has two different stories interacting the people with Jesus with these 12s. And both of them needed God's divine power and authority to do what needed to be done. And I want you to know that today, and you might call it woo-hoo, you might call it spiritual gobbledygook, whatever you call it, I want you to know that your need can be taken care of through the name and the power and authority that Jesus Christ offers. It's a name that is above every name. We prayed this earlier today, and today's an invitation to you to say, listen, the only way that a man can be redeemed is through the name of Jesus Christ, that forgiveness and grace come from him. There's something that was similar between Jairus and the woman, right? What was it? They both came to the place where they kneeled down at the feet of Jesus they expressed their faith in different ways. Jerry said, Lord, if you'd come to my house, you can heal. The woman said, hey, Jesus, if I can just touch your garment, I'll be healed. And Jesus, there's a story in the New Testament of a centurion that came to Jesus and said, I'm a man under authority. I know how authority works. I'd know, Jesus, if you just speak the word, my servant will be healed. 
we see different contexts of the way they thought about Jesus. One of them said, and when Jesus saw this guy's faith and said, you mean you just believe if I speak something's going to happen? Jesus said, I've not seen greater faith in Israel than this centurion that said, well, I believe God at such a high level. I want to invite you. I don't, it doesn't matter what level that you're trusting God and God will meet you at your level of belief and bring inspiration and encouragement to you. Because he met them at their place of belief and encouraged that belief to say, all right, this is where you believe. This is how I'll respond. He went to the house. He met the woman there and today he wants to meet you. He met them at their place of belief and encouraged that belief. That's what God wants to do for you. He wants to meet you at your place of belief. Maybe you're challenged today. Maybe you're struggling today in what you believe. And I want you to know that if you'll allow yourself to fall at his feet and say, you know what, God, I'm going to relinquish control. And you might have suffering. You might say, Lord, I, I don't understand this. I don't know why. But I'm going to trust you that you want to tell a divine story of intersection with you and intersection with others. I believe that God can do something special within you today. He wants you to get the fear out. The anxiety out. He, he wants to get the pressure that maybe it's a part of the, the, the laughing part of you that's saying, I, I can't trust God or God can't do it and say, it's time to get that out of him. Put your hope and your trust in God. I want you to know that the greatest gift that we get from God is the gift of salvation. The greatest miracle is the miracle of redemption where we leave from death to life, become born again, the Bible says. And maybe today you need that. You need to be born again. You, maybe this is speaking to you about your trouble, your trials, and today you're going to say, Lord, I'm going to come to the feet of Jesus. I need to be inspired and encouraged. I need to put my hope in God. And listen, there's lots of ways that you can build your hope. You can read the Word. You can listen to podcasts. You can get around other people, call people and talk about the goodness of God and share in people's burdens, but also celebrate in people's successes of what God is doing. It will inspire and encourage you. Some of you today, that's what you need to begin to do. You need to look for the opportunity to allow God to begin to tell a story through you toward others, not just for yourself in isolation, but in celebration of what God is doing in others. But if you're here today and you don't know Christ, you don't have a personal relationship, and there's a sense in you, this fear in you to say, if you were to die this day, you don't know where you would go. You don't know if you'd go to heaven. You don't know, you don't know if you'd be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to know that he is here for you today, for you to know him, to experience his grace. And just like Jerry, it's just like, to him with the issue of blood, he wants to meet you in your brokenness and bring hope and peace and new life to you. Hope for tomorrow. If that's you, I want you to pray a prayer of surrender and salvation to give your heart to Jesus Christ. You know, if you're going to pray this prayer, there's a link that's going to be seen on this page where you can say, hey, you know, I accepted Christ or uh, what's my next step? And I want you to click on that because we want to connect with you. We want to speak blessing over your life. We want to help you on this journey. But if you need to do that, would you pray this prayer with me right now? This is a prayer of surrender to Jesus Christ to be forgiven of your sins, to have new life and new hope come to your heart. Would you pray this prayer? Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth to die for my sins so I could be saved. And today, with all that I am, I give you my life. Fill me with your peace. Let your grace and joy come into my heart and help me believe and grow in my belief in you. I give you my life. I'm under your power. I'm under your authority. And now I trust that you're going to lead me in the way I should go. I do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, God's with you. We're here with you at Oasis. If you need things, we encourage you to touch base with us. We're going to be taking communion in just a minute. So as we close this thing, we're going to uh, close with a little time together, and then we're going to share in communion. So may God bless you. We look forward to seeing you soon. As a, uh, we're, hopefully we're going to be getting together sooner than later. May God richly bless you. We love you here at Oasis. Have a great day.